Phyllosilicates, let's go. In the textbook, phyllosilicates are talked about on a lot of pages. In fact, so many pages that it makes this family seem like it's a really big deal. Or that there's a lot of them. Or that they're complicated. And really, it's kind of a comp combination of all of those factors. Phyllosilicates are really important minerals for a lot of different geologic reasons. The phyllo has meaning, I think, of Greek, of leaf, and what it ends up producing as the biggest and most important shared property is that these are our sheet silicates. And when we say sheet silicates, we mean that there is a one perfect cleavage in one direction that produces flaky morphology. So we're going to say these are our sheet silicates, and that there is one perfect cleavage that makes flakes. What I want to do is spend a lot of time on the shared properties and a lot less time on the systematic mineralogy part because the shared properties are what's really exciting, I think, about the phyllosilicates. So if we were to draw that structure, we could start by drawing one hexagon. And each part of that hexagon is the base of a single tetrahedra. So go ahead and draw that in. We form a ring, but the ring is actually connected to other rings infinitely in a two-dimensional plane. So once you get that drawn in, we could draw in like the y direction. This goes off to infinity, this structure. And this goes off to infinity in the x direction as well to produce a sheet, full sheet in two dimensions. If you wanted to draw yours in more fully, you could draw in the actual oxygens, and then the big silicon. I'm going to avoid that today just for time's sake. In the center of the rings, there is home for an OH. That ends up being on how, how all the phyllosilicates are structured. So when we look down on the two-dimensional view from above, the bird's eye view, we can see this ring structure that then goes off to infinity right, with more rings and more hexagons. Right, you can visualize that. But what about in the side view? And the side view is actually the reason why, or the structure that we can explain and describe from the side view is why there is a perfect cleavage. So here we've started off with our bird's eye, bird's eye view looking down in two dimensions. But now what I want to do is make a drawing. And this will actually take a minute. This is probably the most important part of today's lecture. What is the side view structure of the phyllosilicates. And to do that, we need to draw a tetrahedral ring from a side view. And the best way to do that is with three triangles. All right, so that's a phyllosilicate tetrahedra. That's one as well. And so when we draw those three together as a unit, that unit is basically this ring from the side view. And so this could extend to infinity, right, in this direction and it could go into infinity in this direction, but we're just drawing it as three. Well, in between, what ends up happening is that there, down here, there's actually another silica tetrahedron structure like this. And so in the textbook, they talk about this as a T-O-T layer. So T stands for tetrahedron, and then the O Sandwiched between the two tetrahedral layers is an octahedral layer. And that octahedral layer has uh, cations like magnesium and iron and aluminum. And so to draw that in, basically it would look something like this. You take an octahedron and you draw it on its side. So it's like this, and then here's where the other diamond part comes in. There. So here in blue, this is our O layer, and it's our octahedral layer where magnesium, iron, and aluminum all can sit. And with this TOT structure, there ends up being an opportunity to create perfect cleavage, because this is one single unit. And so what we'll do is we'll say one sheet. And this one sheet can bond to a second sheet, which I'm going to draw in right here. And it's just, this is going to look, this is supposed to look exactly like the drawing above, where we have a tetrahedral layer and another tetrahedral layer, and in between it is an octahedral layer. 
and I'm just drawing a simple view of it. You can keep this going to infinity in either direction. It's like if you wanted to, you could put in another octahedron here and another octahedron here. That would be fine, but we're just doing one. If we spend too much draw time drawing, we these videos go too long. So this is our second sheet. And what ends up happening, holding these two sheets together, are really weak van der Waals bonds. And because those van der Waals bonds are so weak, they allow breaking and slipping between these two sheets right here. And this is a mineral, this is actually the structure of talc. And what we could say about talc is that it's actually, right, it feels slippery because the van der Waals are so weak. The chemical formula for uh, talc, just so we can like think about it within a structure, is magnesium 3. Mg3, and that sits in the octahedral site, and then Si4O10OH2. And so if you were to think about where all those things are going, well, our oxygens are sitting on the corners of the tetrahedrons and at the corners of our octahedrons. Our magnesiums are hanging out here, and our silicas are hanging out here, and our oxygens are hanging out in the center of these rings. We can kind of think about the octahedrons sorry, not the oxygen, but the OHs are, are back in there. And so that's the structure of talc and the simplest of all the phyllosilicates. But there is a problem. Most of the phyllosilicates have aluminum in their chemical formula. And, that's a, and that aluminum actually, well, I'm not sure if you could say screws things up, but let's just say this, it changes things. So what we're going to have, this is still under shared properties, and I'm going to say that many micas, and mica is a synonym for phyllosilicate, Many micas have Al3 plus substituting for some, not much, but some substituting for some Si4 plus. And it's this substitution that actually makes most micas not feel slippery and most micas be a little stronger because it changes the bonding environment. And so what I'm going to do is I want to, I'd like to draw for you how the aluminum bearing phyllosilicate structure works. And to do that, what we need to do is we need to draw a T-O-T structure just like we did above. You can bear with me as I do this. Okay. We got our octahedrons here in the center. Okay, and we have we can have a bunch of those. And then we have that's layer one, right? So that's number one. And then we can have another one. I want to leave some space in between the two. So we're gonna do another T O T. This is what takes a lot of time in this lecture, is making these drawings. But have fun with it. Make a nice drawing. A phyllosilicate structure. And at this point, the drawing looks exactly the same as it did for our slippery micas, like talc, where we're going to have our octahedrons come down in here. They're just sitting on their side, so they almost look like rhombohedrons, don't they? All right, and so there's our drawing. We have our two sheets. And if there's only van der Waals bonds in this space here, then they slide past one another, and they feel like musk or, or talc. But what we're going to need to do is let's put in some aluminums. And so every single one of the corners is silicon, except for these two blue ones. They're Al3 pluses. So there's not that many that are substituting in, but there's some Al. And let's put in another one here, Al3 plus. What that ends up doing is it, it makes the whole system... I guess you could say two negative because it was supposed to be Si4 pluses, but because we're aluminum three pluses, we don't have as many pluses. And so we get a situation that is slightly too negative because we're missing, missing some, I guess we could say protons, some pluses from 
the silicon four plus and so what ends up happening is to make that charge i guess we could say compensation work out what ends up happening is in between the two layers we insert some big one plus cations and so this so what we're going to do is we're going to insert big one plus cations into this interlayer so we're doing that in red so we could say potassium could be something that fits in here or you could get lithium as something that fits in that interflake layer. And so insert big one cations um, to, into the interlayer. And it is those big cations that strengthen the minerals. Not by too much, but they do strengthen the mineral. So I'm also going to say here is that it increases bond strength and mineral strength. The material will still flake apart and break with a perfect cleavage, but it no longer is so weak that it feels slippery. We're going to just say, so it's not slippery, but still flexible flakes. And that is a pretty in-depth structural look at how the mica minerals work. Now, the next thing I want to do, we're still not going to do the systematic part. What I just want to do first before we do that is just talk about what is the geologic significance of all the phyllosilicates. And there ends up being a lot of significance to these minerals. They're very important rock forming minerals. Like here's an example of a rock outcrop in California where this whole rock here is all a phyllosilicate. It's a rock type called uh, serpentinite made of serpentine and so so we have a lot of different uh, it's a they tend to be rock forming minerals and as rock forming minerals their chemistry therefore matters more and so what they end up doing is they hold much h2o there are water like source or repository in rocks because that OH Oh, you can remember, right? That OH is sitting in here structurally. And that really matters for all of these, for all of these phyllosilicates. But sometimes, oh boy, what's going on with my page here? Let's just zoom back in. Sorry for that little hiccup. If they're holding much water, well, when those rocks go to higher temperatures and pressures, the micas can break down, creating dehydration reactions. And what dehydration reactions do is they actually will then release water. So not only do micas store water, they also will release water. And so water ends up being one of the most important petrologic drivers. And so knowing that the micas are the source of that water is a really important thing. Let me just show you this example. This is an example from the textbook showing a dehydration reaction. What do I mean by dehydration reaction? Well, at uh, look at our x and y axis. So here's temperature and here's pressure. So at the Earth's surface, we're like way down here. And so these are like low conditions. And at low conditions, this phase diagram tells us that muscovite is stable. And muscovite is a mica that can have OH. But if plate tectonics and metamorphism drives you to higher uh, temperatures, or I guess in this case it'd be lower pressures, but it let's just say we increase temperature for some tectonic reason, we will cross that phase boundary and muscovite's no longer stable. It breaks down into potassium, feldspar, and corundum and it releases a bunch of water in the form of a dehydration reaction. That is a big significance of the phyllosilicates. And then the last significance that I want to introduce to you is that the phyllosilicates are the sedimentary clay minerals. And of course, clay is a huge component of soil, and this will matter to us for growing crops and storing water and groundwater systems. So when we see a soil that looks like this, I want you to think about, oh, those are phyllosilicates that are making the physical properties of that clay-rich material. And so with that, the only thing left to do is to just briefly introduce you to the different, whoop, cancel, da, da introduce you to the different species. So let's go through, oh, we can do it this way. Number one, the number one species that I want you to know 
is called muscovite. The chemical formula for muscovite that I want you to know is it's potassium, aluminum, and it's a hydrous mica. So there's words in this chemical formula that I want you to know, just because it gets a little complicated if you don't do it that way. The appearance of muscovite is light colored. It's a light colored mica. It tends to have a pearly luster and it forms in books. And when I say a book, sometimes these flakes are called folia. Folia is like a page. And so you can have a mica crystal. They're actually they tend to form these little hexagons and they stack up all these little flakes on top of one another. And so this is called a book of mica. So that's a good thing to picture in your mind with muscovite. Now, biotite is the next mica mineral that I want you to know. And this one's a little more complicated in that it is potassium and it's aluminum, but it also has iron and magnesium. I'll just underline those to emphasize them. And it is also a hydrous mica. And it is those iron magnesium content that makes this dark. It's still very shiny, but in some colors of blacks and browns. Let's see if I've got a picture of our biotite and muscovite to share with you. Ah, this is an example of muscovite crystals in a granite. So here's our granite and these little silvery bits are muscovite. This is a schist bearing maybe tourmaline crystals, but that background color of the schist, that silver, that's all mica, muscovite mica reflecting light back to your eye. We can look at picture, oop, that's the same picture, isn't it? Let's put it in a different picture. You don't need to see the same one two times. Here's a picture of biotite. So here's an igneous rock, maybe an andesite, and there is a little book of biotite mica. This is a granite, and this granite has quartz and feldspar, and all the black bits in here, those are probably biotite mica. So moving on to the next thing I'd like you to know, number three in this list, number three, this is chlorite. The formula for chlorite is, it is iron, magnesium, hydrous mica. So what we've lost here is we've lost that potassium and aluminum. Chlorite's pretty easy to identify because it is the green mica. And the way it forms is it forms as an alteration or a breakdown product or like a metamorphic product of iron magnesium silicates. So what I want you to put down here is that this is an alteration product of magnesium and iron bearing silicate minerals or it occurs in the green schist facies which is a low temperature pressure um, metamorphic rock meta i better have do i have a picture of it perhaps i do let's see ah yes here we go so here's an image of chlorite this is the kind of green color I want. It's a dark green, right? Not a very rich, beautiful green, but a dark green, but you can still see the flakes reflecting light back to your eye. And then the last one we're gonna write about is talc, which is shown in this picture here. So number four is talc. Here I actually will have you memorize the entire chemical formula, Mg3Si4, O10, OH2. And this tends to be light colored. And one of the dead giveaways is that it is very slippery. It's number one on most hardness scale. It's so soft because of those TOT held together by Van der Waals bonds. And talc forms by alteration of magnesium bearing rocks. An important magnesium bearing rock environment is the mantle. And so we could think of talc being associated with altered mantle. And I said that was the last because when I think of the phyllosilicates, those are the minerals that I mostly think of. But there is this family of minerals called serpentine. And so we're going to add here in the last hurrah, the serpentine group. 
And the serpentine group has a similar formula and a similar geologic occurrence to talc. It's Mg3, Si2, O5, OH4. And what ends up happening is that this tends to form from the breakdown of iron and magnesium bearing rocks, specifically forsteritic olivine. So let's just say that this is um, breakdown of Mg rocks. And specifically, I'm going to say olivine. Ooh, can you tell that that says olivine? Write it down right for yourself. I got a little sloppy there. I feel like I'm rushing against the clock. But basically what ends up happening is if you take olivine from the Earth's mantle, bring it up towards the Earth's surface where water can interact with it, you break down that olivine to serpentine. And the reaction is 2Mg2SiO4, that's olivine, plus H2O, three H2Os, in some metamorphic or surface environment, you will produce serpentine, Mg3Si2O5OH, uh, plus some other products to keep things balanced. We'll go ahead and put it in MgOH2. So that's our reaction, and so olivine is the key for the formation of serpentine. Now I've been calling it a group because there are three different serpentine minerals. One is called an Tigerite. The second is called lizardite. Herpetologist's favorite mineral, yes? Serpent, lizard, uh, and it has to do with the appearance of this mineral. Uh, chrysoteal is our third variety of serpentine. And what's it up happening? I should put a picture in maybe before we talk about this. The, the appearance of serpentine is kind of lizardy, right? There's this variegated greenish color to most of serpentine. And in fact, what I'm going to do is we're going to say antigridite and lizardite look like this. And chrysotil looks like this because chrysotil is our is the is a fibrous crystal habit. Fibrous, another way to say that is asbestiform. Oh boy, I didn't spell that right. As Best to or to oh boy, I'm not confident about that spelling, but it's like asbestos, but it's not harmful to the lungs because serpentine breaks down pretty easily. And so, for your notes, I want you to draw like a vein and I want you to draw in this. And what this is supposed to do is just key in for you that chrysotile is this fibrous asbestos form, where and as. Lizardite and antigridite, and lizardite, by the way, this is the most common form of serpentine. It's like 90% of serpentine is lizardite. This ends up being massive and fine-grained, and it has a waxy luster. Sometimes people call it greasy. These are ways to identify it. I think that's showing up in this picture really nicely. And there also is this um, kind of complex, interwoven, uh, variegated green color. And those are some good tips for identifying serpentine.